Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ. Cyber attacks such as Colonial Pipeline, JBS, and Kaseya have dominated headlines exposing vulnerabilities that corporations face. Joining me to discuss is Megan Samford, International Society of Automation's Global Cybersecurity Alliance Chairperson, and she's also Chief Product Security Officer for Energy Management at Schneider Electric. Megan, it's great to have you with us. Welcome to Trade Talks. Great. Thanks so much, Jill. Happy to be here today. All right, and, and during the last 15 months, did corporations perform digitalization too fast, neglecting the need to implement robust cybersecurity safeguards? Sure, that's, that's a great question, Jill, and I think it's been top of mind for many companies lately. From what I can tell, I, I don't know that they neglected cybersecurity intentionally. I think that the push uh, to digitize and really what, what we've been calling this is that the home office really became an extension of the corporate network. And when that happened, you have increased connectivity, which resulted in an increased uh, what we call an attack surface. So with that, companies today are stepping up to really shore up the cybersecurity controls and frameworks that maybe they weren't able to um, to put in place uh, during the digi digitization process. They're now going back and applying those controls and to be honest with you, I think that we owe a debt of gratitude to many of the companies that stepped up to provide digital mechanisms and ways for their employees to work from home. I think it was absolutely a necessary step. And now we see them going back and doing, again, that due diligence to shore up the controls that maybe they had to put in place very rapidly. With that, um, what the data tells us is that 90% of companies are reporting that they've seen an increase in cybersecurity attacks. At the same time, 93% of those same companies are saying that they did have to, they did have to delay those security controls uh, in the past 15 months and they are coming back. It's one of the reasons why we formed the ISA Global Cybersecurity Alliance because we wanted companies to be able to pool together and pool our resources together to really apply a common and consistent framework for these security controls, especially as it applies to critical infrastructure protection. The U.S. government could not stop U.S. companies from paying ransom when faced with a cyber attack. Is there ever a time when paying ransom is a wise strategy? I think it's a wise strategy if it's your last resort. I never recommend paying the ransom uh, because there are some ethical issues in place there. Conversely, there can also be ethical issues in place depending on the type of infrastructure that's being impacted by the ransomware. Say it's a hospital where you know that uh, every minute that you're offline or you don't have access to patient records or operating rooms or whatever you need, that can also result in real life safety impact. So I, I always say that the question has to be answered in a way that it really depends on the company's confidence in their ability to, uh, to do what we call a clean, a clean wipe. So if you become infected with ransomware, one of the, the ways that you can respond to remediate the issue is to do a clean wipe of your system. So this is not unlike, uh, you know, each of us has cell phones, right? If you get a new cell phone or you're changing over carriers or whatever, you do that clean wipe and then maybe you'll restore to kind of a clean or a gold image. It can be the same scenario, especially in operational technology environments. And so, again, it depends on their ability to do that clean wipe and then go back and have proper backups in place to perform that restore. If they're not confident that they can do a clean wipe and perform the necessary backup and restoration, then paying the ransom may be, it's still a bad option, but it may be the best option that they have in play at the time. And Megan, a push for government regulation is happening. Is there a proactive approach that private companies can enact to fend off these costly and, and stringent cybersecurity oversights? Sure, absolutely. I think the, the best way to, to kind of um, reason with, with regulators and the, and the government or any other entity that has a, a compliance role in cybersecurity, I think is to demonstrate that you can and you want to behave responsibly proactively without needing regulation. And again, going back to the, the premise of why Schneider Electric and Rockwell Automation and Honeywell and Johnson Controls why we founded the Global Cybersecurity Alliance, 
was to pool together to demonstrate compliance against an international standard that's actually been in the works for well over 15 years now, which is called IEC 62443. And I don't want to throw number jargon out at you all, but what 62443 is, is it's a common baseline international standard. So it's not just US, it's not European, it's not just Asia, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a single country. It is all the countries backing together. And in fact, it's been endorsed by the United Nations. But what it provides us is kind of a, a single pane of glass of controls that we all seek to comply with, whether you're a supplier like my company, or you're an asset owner like a hospital or a colonial pipeline or any other significant asset, um, asset, or you're an integrator. Maybe you're a company that actually installs and securely deploys the equipment. This gives us all a common sheet of music to sing from and applying these controls. So it doesn't create an environment where you have winners or losers or one group is over here doing one thing, applying one controls framework, and then a customer is dealing with another company that's doing something completely different. We all have chosen and we've all been working on these standards for many years now to get them to the state that they're effective, they're the most efficient and um, you know, cost efficient way to uh, apply the controls and our customers can have um, faith that they have been applied in a way that is consistent internationally, not just within the United mm -hmm. States or any particular geographic area. So we see benefits across the board and we're really hoping that not only the U.S. government, but other governments uh, in the EU and around the world will say, 62443 is a great standard. It has everything in it that we need. It goes above and beyond. And it's really going to help companies um, manage risk in a, in a consistent way so that everyone's not off doing their own thing. All right, Megan, we appreciate the insight. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks. I'm Jill Malentrino, Global Market Reporter at NASDAQ. Thank you.